Well, good morning. Good morning. It's great to be in the house of the Lord. I just want to add my welcome to you. Those who are in person and those who are online or those who may be watching this a little bit later, it is a joy to be here in the house of the Lord this Sunday morning. If you haven't noticed, today we're going to talk about communion. It's why as Baptists, this particular ordinance is important to us, for us to take part into something united, not only with our congregation, but those who are doing this around the world. It's important for us to align ourselves physically, spiritually, emotionally as one, one body of believers. So one of the two ordinances that we celebrate, the other being believer's baptism, have in itself its own mystic qualities. And if we are not careful, we can be quick to forget why we celebrate communion in the first place. This morning I want to open up with a fairly difficult passage. It's difficult because it's not a happy-go-lucky passage. It's not one of those passages that you're going to walk away from church this morning all happy with glee. It's not one of those. It's a challenging passage. It's a passage that challenges us to be attentive to how God is working. So my challenge to you this morning is to stay awake and to be receptive to the blessings that God has, even in a difficult passage. This scripture isn't often talked about, but it is necessary for us as a church body to discuss. It's often skipped over or made light of, but I want to, and I feel that we as a church should address it head on. So if you would this morning, whatever Bible verse that you have, version you have, whether you have it on your phone, a tablet, or a paper Bible, and if you don't have a Bible, there should be a Bible somewhere around you, would you please turn with me to 1 Corinthians 11. We're going to be in verse 17 to 32. It simply says this, in the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are, there are divisions among you. To some extent, I believe it. No doubt there has to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. For I received from the Lord what I also passed to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ and drink in judgment upon themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick 
and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we are more discerning with regards to ourselves, we do not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined. And that we will not be finally condemned with the world. Let us pray. Blessed Heavenly Father, we lift up to you in this time who we are as a congregation. We ask that you dwell here in this place, that as we dive deeper into the word, that you open up our hearts, our souls, our minds to be able to receive you. Lord, set me aside so that it's only you shown this morning. Teach us to decrease so that you may increase. And it's in Jesus Christ's name that we pray these things. All God's people said. When I was 14, I looked forward to the first Sunday of the month. It's not because there was great fellowship in church. It had its perks. Not because the worship was jamming. It was not because there was amazing preaching. My dad did a great job. It was because it was communion Sunday. And every communion Sunday, after assisting and leading in worship, when almost everyone was gone from the sanctuary, me and my best friend would come down off the stage and head directly to the communion table to finish off the fresh baked bread and the grape juice. I would take one container of the communion and my buddy would take the other and we would sit there and, and, and eat till we had our fill. It became quite a tradition. It became such a tradition that it went from just not me and my buddy, but, but the neighborhood kids in which we were trying to reach came and they partook as well. And we were all eating the communion after communion. So after finishing the elements, a gaggle of teenage boys would come down and we would finish off the communion. Unbeknownst to me, until I was called into pastoral ministry, there were some congregants, can you imagine this? There were some congregants who didn't like our behavior. Matter of fact, it was addressed at a business meeting. And after hearing all the complaints that everybody had, the youth pastor, who was my dad, stood up and said, I'll take care of this. And they entrusted Reverend Dr. Matt Lyons to take care of those boys who were eating the communion elements. Well, the following communion service came around and something was different. We did the service and everything was great. Fellowship was great, music was great, the sermon, it was great. And then we got to the end of the service and people started filing out. And then my buddy and I do what we have traditionally done. I hop from behind the drum shield and my buddy gets off of the piano and we head down to have our fill of communion. And my eyes locked with my other buddies as they're sitting in the corner as we're going to devour this bread and drink this juice. What was different was as I was heading to the communion table, my dad was standing there. Him and the deacons And I paused and I looked at my dad and said, are we really about to do this? Because it wouldn't have been the first time this gaggle of boys were to wrestle with the deacons and wrestle we would have. 
But as we approached the communion table, we got closer, and my dad opened up the communion tray. And he and the deacons served this gaggle of boys the rest of communion. Matter of fact, they partook as well. What could have been a disaster on their part turned into a discipleship opportunity. We broke bread in a common place. We laughed. We told jokes. And a bond was created. I'm still not sure if Emmanuel, the church that I was from, fully understands what they did in that moment. Or how they impacted the lives of the young men standing at that communion table. But it completely changed everything for me. For us to fully understand today's text, we have to understand the divisive nature that the Apostle Paul was talking to the church of Corinth. See, they were surrounded by Greek influence and Roman influence. They were subject to great wealth. So much so that it divided the church into the haves and have-nots. The rich can partake in their fill and have as much communion as they wanted to, and the poor did not. When it came to their gathering, it was about lifting themselves up and not God. They put themselves up on a pedestal and made themselves their own gods. And for that, the Apostle Paul wrote this. In the following directives, I have no praise for you. For your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there is division among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there is to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. For when you eat, some of you go ahead and have your own private suppers. And as a result, one person remains hungry and another drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. No praise was given for their behavior. They approached church, they approached worship, they approached the Lord's Supper, they approached their relationships with others was extremely disrespectful and dishonoring to God. So I have three points I want to give to you about communion that I think we can draw from these passages. The first one I submit to you, church, is that communion is not a place of divisiveness, but a place of unity. The idea of unity sounds simple, doesn't it? But yet humans often misdefine what unity actually looks like. Oftentimes, unity in our eyes is the ability for someone to bend to our will, to assimilate to what I want. If they conform to the way I think, my thoughts, my wishes, then and only then can unity happen. The truth is, church, unity calls for sacrifice. It calls for sacrifice from all parties involved to give up their individual desires to the collective so that the collective can cling to a greater good of everybody involved. It's exactly what Jesus did. It's the whole reason why we partake in communion in remembrance of the sacrifice that Christ did on the cross to die a sinner's death, to be raised into the new life that he has given to us. Communion is not about being divided. It's about being united. Point number two, communion is not a place 
where we can be proudly boasting, but a place where we humbly remember. The Apostle Paul writes this, For I receive from the Lord what I also pass to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Paul is quoting Jesus here, and often we celebrate this portion of 1 Corinthians. Some version of this is often said at the communion table, and we often stop there. It's extremely important for us to realize that communion wasn't created for us to boast about the things that we have done. It's not created for us to be proud in the things that we have accomplished. But as we partake in communion, it's a proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What Jesus did. That by, by taking communion, we are rededicating our hearts, our souls, our minds to solidify, if you will, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And how that impacts our life. Let's go a little deeper. There's a deeper meaning here for why Paul wrote these specific words at this specific time to these specific people. It's a nice quote. Yeah, most pastors know it. But what Paul was really doing here as he's writing this note to the Corinthian church, was that he was realigning their perspective. He was course correcting their worship and their gatherings. See, the truth is worship isn't about you. Worship isn't about how you feel. Worship isn't about how things look or even how things sound. Worship is not about you. Worship is about a humble approach to the throne of mercy and grace. Paul was saying, remember Jesus and keep Jesus at the center of your church. It's not about Fifth Avenue Baptist or getting our name out there. But if our intention is to just praise us, we will fail 100% of the time. If our evangelistic efforts is not about putting Jesus Christ first, we will fail. Jesus Christ has to be at the forefront of everything we do. We can have great programs. We can have great musicians. You can have a dynamic preacher. But if Christ isn't first, then everything else is dust in the wind. You can have the greatest commission system. You can have the greatest business meetings. But if Christ isn't first, then it means nothing. We're not putting Christ first. As in this, Christ, we do things in Christ, for Christ, and through Christ. We will fail. So as the Apostle Paul was, was realigning the Corinth church, saying, allow your missions, your ministries, the things that you do as a people, as you gather and reflect on Jesus Christ, and allow that to be your proclamation to the world. Many of you know that I enjoy church history. I almost enjoy church history as much as I enjoy church architecture. 
Both of these things can say a lot about a church's future. And so I will share with you what I've shared with, with many people before. And if you've heard this from me, I'm sorry, but I'm going to say it again. When I was called to this church almost six years ago, I walked into this sanctuary and I was in awe. This is a beautiful place to worship. This is a beautiful place to praise God. But if I was truly honest with myself, when I looked at the stage, I saw a split pulpit lectern. And as a Baptist boy, that was unfamiliar to me. I slowly grew used to it. Slowly? Ricky, you got me. Slowly. I grew accustomed to it. But as I was intrigued by the architecture of this building, I wanted to answer the question of why. Because this church has gone through renovations. So as I was digging deep into the why of a split lectern, I was simply shared this. That is typical for churches who have split lecterns to put their altar table in the middle of their stage. And we do so as well. Why, Vaughn? Of course, you're asking as well. Because it's not about the pastor. It's not about the speakers or the prayers. It's not about the musicians. But it's about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And that is the focal point of the church. So though it's not typical Baptist, it is very theologically steeped in greatness of understanding who Jesus is and how we can align ourselves with Christ, the nature of Christ here at Fifth Avenue. It reminds the church of what is really important. We may have our own wants and our own desires, but as long as we keep the table as the center focus point, we continue to realign ourselves with Jesus Christ. You may have heard me use this word realignment a lot. It's a challenge, isn't it? This is how the Apostle Paul challenged the church of Corinth. He said, so then whoever eats of this bread and drink of the cup in an unworthy manner is guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment upon themselves. This is why many young, many among you are weak and sick, a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we are more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, when we are judged this way by the Lord, when we are judged this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. This right here, church, this portion right here, this is what makes this passage difficult. It makes it difficult because, because I think we should address it head on. You wanna know why things aren't working well? You wanna know why things are not like they should? You wanna know why there's so much evil in the world? Here's an answer. You want to know why there's so much pain and so much death, so much destruction around you? It's hard for us to accept discipline. I want to share a story that's not in my notes. But my mom and my grandmother enjoyed disciplining me. From your chuckles, I'm assuming you understand. 
And my mom used to say this phrase, this hurts me more than it hurts you. And at the time, I said, no way. And though I don't discipline my children in the same fashion that I was disciplined, to set them in time out destroys me. So in a way, understanding discipline as an adult has its different context. It's uncomfortable. Because the discipline here that Paul is talking about is the ability to examine ourselves in light of who Christ is, to regularly examine our hearts, to regularly examine our motives, our wishes, our desires, and to see if they align with Scripture, see if they align to the nature of who Christ is. If it's not loving, church, it's not Jesus. If it's not loving, it is not Jesus, and then it turns into a reckless misuse of God's gifts, talents, and blessings that he has bestowed to you for you to steward if you are not doing it in Christian love. My last point is this. Communion's not a place of recklessness, but a place of extreme intentionality. Intentionality to the point of self-examination. To understand who you are in light of who Christ is. Understanding that we, that you and I will never measure up. And yet God saw fit to look through the lens of grace and to send his son to die in our place. The intentionality to align ourselves with Christ so that it is not ourselves that, that is reaching the world, but we are reaching the world for Christ, in Christ, and through Christ for the kingdom of God. I finish up by saying this. I would bet that Emmanuel Baptist Church in Charleston, West Virginia, doesn't fully understand the impact it made for the kingdom the day that those gaggle of boys ate the communion bread. A simple intentional act of love had a ripple effect. Follow me if you will, symbolically, we couldn't get enough Jesus. And their nurturing that desire caused my buddy to pursue music ministry. He went to Audison brought us college for music and is currently serving as a music minister in Charleston. They don't know the impact that they had. It caused me to pursue pastoral ministry to finish my Masters of Divinity to continue to press to get a second Masters in counseling and to pursue doctorate of ministry. Church, we don't know the type of impact we have when we encounter people with the love of Jesus Christ. If we are faithful to align ourselves with the nature of Jesus Christ, we can do so much good for the kingdom. So why do we partake in communion? To remember that our God is a God of unity to remember the sacrifice of the broken body and the blood that was shed, to remember that we have a very intentional God, that if we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. So not only this day, but let every day be in celebration of communion. Let us pray. God, we thank you for the opportunities that you place before us to love one another despite our differences. To take a hand of someone in need, to help uplift those you have called to teach, to preach, to love, to guide. Lord, I pray that we do so in the right spirits, with the right hearts, not with our 
own motives, our own selfish desires, but it is in you that we align ourselves to who you are. Encourage us today to be your hands and your feet to a broken world. And if there's anyone out there, Lord, who is hearing about your love, your mercy, your grace for the first time, allow them to come and accept you as their Lord and Savior. Lord, we thank you and we praise your name. All God's people said,